Hello, everybody. Hi, everybody. It's Jamie and Marcus here. And this is the Chef on a Mission radio show. And we are back. We are back, yes. We it's been back. a while. Actually, I have never really been on. <laughs> You've been a guest on many times. Yes. Right? You and I are jumping to this show um, full speed ahead. It's Jamie and I, uh, the Chef on a Mission show. And we are restaurateurs broadcasting our passion. It's all about eating, learning, and living. Absolutely. So uh, we're super excited to be back. Like I said, I'm finishing up a round of laryngitis. I apologize if my voice is a little, um, how would you describe my voice? Scratchy. Scratchy, okay. A little scratchy, but little, it sounds okay. A little scratchy, okay. A little scratchy, but it sounds all right. You're good. All right, so we want to really drop a bunch of very important, valuable information for everyone here. And um, so you can make empowering choices when you go to the market, you go to a farmer's market, when you go out to eat, you go grab a bottle of wine, or when you travel Europe. Absolutely. So, um, so we're going to give you a lot of information. Taught lots and lots. All the time. <laughs> All the time. So, yep. So, chef on a chef on a mission radio dot com. Um, you can find uh, more information about Jamie and I. We are restaurant owners. We have a travel business, and we're uh, business coaches. coaches. So, we're going to talk about all of that and more. Um, Jamie, what's first on the topic today? Sure. So uh, you did a demo yesterday. Tell a little bit about your demo that you did yesterday, and and uh, share some information with us. Um, you know, it was awesome. It was really yeah. awesome. Very, very educational. So you know, let's share some of the information. I mean, you talked about um, oils. You talked about risotto. You talked about um, balsamic, Vin balsamic vinegar. vinegar. Um, so touch a little bit um, and let our guests know. Um, you Can know. I talk about the risotto? Yeah, talk about the risotto um, first. Everybody, everybody, everybody loves risotto. Yes. I don't know if a single person does not love risotto. Um, risotto <laughs> is a typical classical Italian dish um, made in all over Italy. Uh, depending on what region you're in is what you put differently in it. Um, uh, risotto, when you go to a restaurant, folks, is typically an insane amount of butter. A lot oh, of butter. A lot of butter. <laughs> a lot of Parmesan cheese. Reggiano. It's supposed to be Reggiano or maybe Grana, um, but a lot of other places, um, American restaurants, will use uh, an imitation Parmesan cheese. Um, but we'll talk about that on another show. About I was just going to say, let's talk about just risotto just and, and the rice that you use. That's a great point, the rice. Yeah. So a lot of people know about Arborio. Because that makes a big difference, right? Oh, the rice makes, makes a, a huge difference. difference. A lot of people know about Arborio rice. And Arborio rice is the dish that you'll, the rice you'll see that, that makes risotto. Now risotto is a creamy like porridge, rice porridge. It is unlike other rice. Other rice you put a lid on, you keep it um, on low heat and you don't turn stir it, you don't really open it. It's one of those things when it's done, it's done and you don't touch it during cooking process. Risotto is the opposite. You have to stir, you have to touch, you have to constantly agitate it and you keep the lid off and you keep adding, you don't add all the liquid at one time, you add it in slow increments. So risotto is basically a, a ratio of one to three, one part rice, three parts liquid, add butter, add cheese, add whatever else you want like lobster, mushrooms, truffles, parsley, shrimp, you name it, you can add it. <laughs> so whatever you like, you add. So that one to three ratio is always consistent. A lot of people, if you pick open a book right now, you'll probably see 75% of the books, they're gonna call for a rice called Arborio. There are three rices that the Italians use, or there's three rices that are approved for risotto. Arborio is probably the least used in Italy. The number one used rice is called Carnaroli, about 10 to 20% more in cost. Um, Violone Nano is another one, but Carnaroli is the one that the Italians use. The Italian chefs use it, and they use it because of the fact that it holds better. It ha gets, it, it stays al dente in the center, it gets that creamy texture better than Arborio. And risotto is one of those things where you, when you cook risotto, you have to serve it. It's not like it can sit around for half an hour. Regular rice, you can let it sit around, pop it in the microwave, which we don't recommend. Or in our case, we take our brown rice, we cook it the day before, and we just heat it up in a saute pan. Risotto does not have that flexibility. Risotto is meant to be consumed. If it goes past a few minutes, 10, 15 minutes, you put it in a pan, a baking dish, a, um, uh, a glass Pyrex, you put it in the refrigerator, and you make risotto cakes for the next day. That's typically what happens. So 
Arboreal rice is known to be the creamiest and hold the texture up the best. Worth every extra penny of the 10 to 20% mm -hmm. more that it costs. Yes, absolutely. And I learned that many, many years ago from a chef that worked in Northern Italy at a Michelin two-star restaurant. And he goes, Marcus, when he came back to the US, he goes, the Arborio is a joke. They don't use it. And we find that when we go to Italy, we go to Italy a lot. Mm -hmm. So we find out that, yeah, a carnaroli is the rice that they use, Arborio. So why don't they use or, 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 or how do you say it? Ar Arborio. Arborio. Um, I think it's just something that they'll send elsewhere and send out. Um, it can be used. It doesn't make bad risotto, but the Carnaroli makes better, better, ris risotto. better risotto. And a lot of chefs or restaurants are price sensitive. So if they see a case of Arborio for $50, they're probably not going to pay 65 for Carnaroli. Right. Because right? they're like, oh, I'm making risotto, it's 15 bucks more. Which is reality, you know, 10, 20 percent more. It's not that much, and it makes a better product. But it's just it's it's there because it's price sensitive. Okay. So that's the deal with that. Um, and so I give this whole demo on risotto. You start with the onion, you sweat it. Um, I like to use a little bit of sunflower oil, unrefined, unfiltered sunflower oil. Does a lot of good benefits for cooking, um, stability wise. And heat wise, it's also just, gives a really nice flavor oh, as does. well, right? Fresh sunflower. Oh my gosh, it's so good. Like, yeah, a little nutty in there, but really oh, good. Yeah, yeah. So um, you sit there and you basically stir this. Right. You add the rice. You toast the rice off a little bit, the oil. And you start adding water. liquid, 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 liquid. You can add water. You can do stock. You can do vegetable stock, chicken stock, lobster stock if you're making lobster mm -hmm. risotto, right? Mushroom stock if you're making mushroom. Um, if you're using soaked porcinis, you take the water from the soaking, the porcinis, and you use that to make the risotto. Can you, you make it vegan? You can, absolutely. Yeah. You could use like a vegan butter. Vegan or, butter or olive oil. Or olive oil, okay. And skip the cheese. Nice. In South Southern Italy, you're going to find more olive oil based ones versus Northern Italy with the butter and the cream. Okay. Um, and you really don't add cream. I'm sorry. You really don't add cream to risotto. That's not one of the typical, typical things that you would add. It's, it's butter and, and the Reggiano, the Parmesan cheese. So and when we travel, we see a lot of risotto. <laughs> we see a ton of risotto. Yeah. And risotto, a lot of risotto and a lot of polenta. Yes. And we've had some good risotto uh, when we've traveled in Italy. Some really good risotto. And we've had some not so good. We've had some not so good risotto. <laughs> yeah. yeah, even in Italy, you'll get some not so yeah. good risotto. Depends on where you go. and yeah. Italy is a tourist trap in a lot of bigger areas. Mm -hmm. And you get to those Americanized tourist traps. A buyer beware basically yes. because you need to understand where you're going and, and like it's literally the difference sometimes of going two blocks off the beaten path if you're in like an area like Siena um, Luca um, Florence is tough because Florence is really Americanized really tourist thought you know tourist yes three to go as they say you need to understand really where you're going a CZ we will walk down the streets in a CZ mm -hmm. And you know the whole main strip is all Americanized restaurants, and we knew we were when we were going into one. And we just like, oh, that wasn't that good. Right, I remember. You know, that, yeah. 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 So we were with our kids there. So, um, Jamie, why are we in Italy so much? We're talking. We're going to talk a lot yeah, about Italy. Yeah, we are. Yeah. So we um, we uh, do travel tours um, to Italy, mostly Italy. Um, there is a love affair to, with Italy that people just love Italy and want to travel so you know we have um trips right from north and central and south um we have been to all of these places um and you know we bring that to to our guests right right to, so to anybody, anybody who wants, wants to travel to... with us really right exactly so for example our last trip we were in apulia campania basilicata lazio umbria tuscany. and tuscany <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how many miles we put on that, that car, but it. we were everywhere, yeah. right? We were down as far as almost the cape yeah. of the of of, of, of the boot, of the, boot yeah. of the heel, of the heel yeah. all the way up into Florence yeah. um, in a matter of two and a half weeks. But we do guided tours to Italy. We take guests or anybody who wants to go to wineries that we have relationships with, wineries that we know, um, small family-run wineries or larger-run family-run wineries throughout Italy, and it's a food culture. Um, I mean, it's basically a food and wine tour. It's a, yeah. I mean, it is loaded with really good wines, really good relationships, and really good food. <laughs> Where can people find information about these trips? Absolutely. So uh, you can go to VIP 
uh, WineryVacations.com, right? VIP WineryVacations.com. Um, and, you know, you can always email us and ask us any questions. And, you know, yep. that would and be And we're, awesome. ha we're having a glass right now of Cantelle. Yes, it's from uh, southern Italy, uh, near Lecce. Um, so when you go to the heel, right, it's only a 30 mile radius from one ocean to the other. Ocean. Right, yeah. So you could basically be on two oceans within both 30, coasts. Both coasts within 30 minutes. And so um, this is particularly a little south of Lecce. Um, and if I remember correctly, I think it's more towards the west side or. I think east so. Side. I think, I think it's the more west. towards the west, west side. side. Yeah. Um, and uh, they make some awesome, awesome wines. I actually have some in my glass as well. And um, and uh, they make some really good wines. Um, you know, they make a ton of wine. Very interesting down, down in uh, in southern Italy and how um, how it came about, right? Um, how they started making wines there because they didn't necessarily make wines there for a very long time. It was mostly a growing area, so they grew grapes, and then the northern, um, they would come down and get the grapes and bring them north and actually make wine up north, right? Right, they were just a bulk, a bulk. A bulk they, they, they made bulk, bulk growers, wine, bulk, bulk, bulk growers, wine, or yeah. they made grape and sent their yeah. grapes or their juice to the north, and the north blended it with their wines. Um, so the history of southern Italian wineries is a newer history, 20, 30, 40 years yes. the most. But they're amazing. I mean, and so there are wineries that have been there for a very long time. Oh, absolutely. And they're just being reopened, right? Like there's a they're lot being, of... They're, 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 they switched over from from a co-op or they switched over right. from there you go, yeah. a, a grape grower to a winery to a mm -hmm. winemaker. Um, but they're making amazing Primitivos and Manduria. Oh gosh, amazing. They're making amazing Alianicos and Volturre. When you head into Campania, into the Tarassi region, amazing big powerhouse wines, um, and just all over. Even and you can actually taste um, the sea, right? You can actually taste like it's very much more um, the salinity, salty, yes. And, and you get that flavor from the southern uh, compared to the northern Italy uh, wineries, which is really cool. So when we were there on our last trip, we. There were many sheep herders. Oh yes, and, there were. <laughs> and you would just have literally all the traffic would stop while a guy with a couple dogs and, and two hundred like, yeah, sheep <laughs> just cross the road. Not even cross the road, just walking yeah. down the road. It was pretty crazy. And you yeah. you just knew you had to do like a one lane while these guys yeah. were there and all the sheep were following each other and the dogs were there and the herder was there and it was pretty cool and they just go from property to property to property down there. And uh, these are the things that we see when we go down there that we show you. And they're family Or when we go anywhere, we yeah. show you things that are, that are like that. And we were in some really back parts on our one oh, of yeah. our last trips to Italy in the, in the south. We were in some really back parts um, where we're like, wow, this is like really yeah. cool. It was really cool. So while well, we're looking for the addresses. Yeah, so, so yeah. if you want to travel, VIP Winery Vacations. If you're into food and wine, and you don't necessarily have to be a wine connoisseur um you will learn a ton about wine um on that trip so on yeah. any of our trips that we do so yeah. absolutely all right yeah. what's next jamie what's what are we gonna talk absolutely. about next let's talk a little bit about our bar let's talk about or the bar or or drinks and and yeah um, and um liquors that come from from bars i mean we you know we're very conscious right um and we're teaching uh lots of people lots of things about being conscious about you know the things that they're drinking but um but it's very interesting right very interesting how um there's a lot of dyes Dyes. A lot of dyes in in a lot of these liquors that are behind the bars. And a lot of it's common sense. A lot of people know, like, and hey, you can see that, I mean, like, is Midori really green? Right. <laughs> um, is Aperol really like? How do they get that color in Aperol? Well, you know, Aperol Campari, they do use dyes now, mm -hmm. but there are natural coloring still available um, in the spirit world. So we were the other day looking at, um, a, a rep sales rep came in to show us some Pomplemousse. Yes. He's like, and what does he say? He's like, the Pomplemousse's brand is good. It's a well-known brand. Oh, yeah, this is a well-known brand. They don't put any coloring or anything he's like, like he's that. Like, he's yeah. like, it's a legit company. You'll like it. Yeah. And we look at the back label and what do you see? Red dye. Red dye. Red dye's in it. And I'm like, well, there's red dye. And he's like, well, yeah. they have to. I'm like, well, no, they don't have to put red dye in it. Right. You can put, Cochineal, 
And he's like, Cochineal? And we're like, yeah, the, the, the beetle extract. They right. take these red beetles from Mexico, and that's the coloring dye, and that's what they use. And that's been used for a very long time in spirits. It's the cochineal carminic acid mm -hmm. or carmine extract are the three words to look for. Those are the buzzwords. Um, so it's not vegan by any means. It's not vegan. But um, they're not using red dye number 40. Um, and they're... Um, it's really a more, much more natural base product. So we pull out our pomplamousse, which is made from an organic producer in Germany, France. I can't remember. France, that. France, or in France, and we pull that out and we taste side by side. And ours doesn't have as yeah. nearly the color as his. Ours is a duller color, um, and it's not bright. And we're like, okay, you, you know, he knows we can't put the, the this bright colored fake colored stuff behind our bar. And Pablo and Moose is grapefruit. You, yeah, yeah Pablo Moose, I'm sorry. Pablo Moose is, is grapefruit liqueur. So. And what, Jamie, what are some good drinks to use for that? Oh, wow. I mean, you can make a grapefruit mojito with it, oh. which is unbelievable. Uh, you can make a grapefruit margarita. Um, you could do um, grapefruit, uh, so Pablo Moose um, gin and tonic. Um, I mean, you can really do a lot of different things with uh, with pomple mousse. I mean, grapefruit. you could drink it on the rocks. I mean, it's great. Yeah. You know, so it's basically like a grapefruit liqueurish yes. type spirit. It's got a lot of grapefruit in you know flavor in it, so uh, it's really pretty cool. So, um, and uh, the grapefruit um, or the pomple mousse mojito is very popular. Oh my gosh, it's delicious. That's that's, that's one yep. that that I love. I love making that one. So, so folks, um, if you don't know much about food dyes. There's been a lot of research and a lot of people that have reported back when they give their kids food dyes, uh, the kids become erratic. Uh, their their behavior comes off. They, they become angry. Some kids become depressed. And there's all these documented things when it comes to food dyes. Mm -hmm. um, and if you go through an elimination diet, some of you will find that your kids are, their behavior is going to change. And But folks, it's everywhere. M&Ms, um, Kool-Aid, all the drinks. The, 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 but really the, the anything lollipops. you put in your body, right? You know, I mean, and that's part of our show here, right? Is talking about what, what you eat and, and what you put into your body. Right. So, you know, when you do those elimination diets, you know, you're going to find out that things affect you in different ways. And uh, red dyes is one of those things. Red dyes is a huge one. Yeah. All called dyes. Yes. You know, blue dyes, are, they're all out there. So, um, you know, especially when you go to a bar, just if you're interested to know, those those dyes do exist in a lot of the food and a lot and a lot of the, the spirits behind there. They rely upon that. Even caramel color is in a lot of things too. Oh yeah, and you would never even really think about it. So right. you know, you order, you like order like a, a drink, you're not even thinking about it. No, you order Namaro and there's like color co co caramel color. Caramel color in it. Color in it yeah. yeah. So it's not like it's not really getting that color from all the herbs it was in. Like I'm not sure about Jägermeister, but Jägermeister probably has. I'm sure. Caramel coloring in it. So yeah. Think, folks, so this is what happens. This is what happened to the spirit industry. In a nutshell, they globalized. You had these small, independently run distilleries a hundred years ago, fifty mm -hmm. years ago. The big brands got greedy. They came in like Diageo, Brown Foreman. They came in. They got greedy. They bought distilleries up. They started upping production. They realized things that like cochineal was too expensive, and they wanted or, to cut costs. Or so, this this this, yeah. this product was too expensive. So how can they synthetically make an ingredient? And some of them don't even distill. So we, I just did a thing on, on Tito's vodka, and a lot of vodka distilleries are like this. Tito's is not a distillery, folks. Tito's is a bottler. They buy their stuff from right. Midwest grain products out of Kansas which distills a massive amount. So does Archer Daniels Midland, and there's one more. There's three big guys in the U.S. that make whiskey and neutral grain spirits, and you literally can go in there and buy barrels, buy the neutral grain spirit, add your coloring to the neutral grain spirit, add your flavoring, and then call it lemon vodka. Right. You can call it lemon vodka. Literally call it lemon vodka. That's, that's how that works. Um, Smirnoff used to be the number one vodka in America, and now it's Tito's. So what Tito's does is, and they're not they're not the only ones guilty of this, but Tito's claims they do hand batch or small batch, handmade. They buy the neutral grain spirit already done and distilled. Now some vodka distilled vodka producers, packers, will simply take that vodka and take it from Archer Daniels Midland or Midwestern Grain Products and stick it in a bottle. 
Not even alter it. Right, and just put their name on the bottle. Put their name on it. it. That's it. Not even alter it. Right, not even alter it. Put their name on it. Some of them will put put things in the bottle and make it look cool, and some will, you know, put it through special charcoal filtering to get some of the bitterness out or the, the harshness out. Tito's will actually run it through pot stills. So they take something that's already been distilled, and they run it through pot stills. Mm. Um, and so Tito's will not give a tour. Do you know they why? They don't have tours. They don't have tours. They don't do tours. There's no masher. There's no grain but silo. They're, they're not. That, they're, that's not their business. They're, they're their not business a, is not making the vodka, right? Right. Their business is not making vodka. They just run it through a, a, dist, a another distilling process that's already made, and right. then they bottle it. So there's no grain. There's no silos. There's no masher. So that's and the, the owner was quite brilliant, actually, right? Uh, he's he's a mean, great businessman. He's a great businessman, and so he knew, right? He knew um, what he was doing, and um, you know, he scaled this, his business, he, right? And you know, we read, I read that article, so um, it, it talked about the fact that Texans, right? Because it's from Texas. Yeah. That Texans love things from Texas, <laughs> and people not from Texas love, love things, things from, from Texas. Texas, right? Like you know, you're always joking and saying you know things from Texas are, are big really like Texas. Texas. Big Lake, Texas. So and Austin, people have a love here with Austin. Yeah, and so he knew what he was doing, right? He knew that he this capitalized. Is, he on. capitalized right on on the whole thing. So yep. yeah, yep. So, so yeah, yeah. So you know, just buyer beware. Um, it's gonna be hard. That's a lot of questions. That's what we always say, right? And we're yeah. gonna constantly say that throughout our shows is ask questions, ask questions in ask restaurants, questions. ask questions on the internet. You know, Google things. I mean, it's very easy now, right? To yeah. To look things up. Oh, it's so easy. It's so, so easy. easy. So yeah. I saw an, I saw a note recently. It was in a doctor's office. It was posted on Facebook, and the note basically said, "Don't confuse your Google search with my doctorate degree, my medical degree, basically." Mm. And it was funny because we have the power in our hands, folks, to self-educate ourselves. To educate ourselves. A lot of stuff on the internet is misleading, but there's a lot of totally 100% legitimate yeah. things. And honestly, your doctor's afraid of you, the pharmaceutical company's afraid of you going online and figuring out that vitamin C is what you need, or that aspirin's really not that healthy for you, or that this drug you shouldn't be taking, or this is how you cure or reverse acid reflux. They don't want you to know that kind of stuff. No, of course <clears throat> they don't, because if, if, they, if you find out that kind of stuff, what happens? They lose they their jobs. They lose their jobs, or they don't make as much money, or pharmaceutical companies don't make their money. So they no. put fear tactics into yeah um, into patients, saying don't don't you know don't don't look that up online, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, and you know, folks, there's a ton of great legitimate stuff on the internet. And they ask a lot of questions. Ask you know, a lot of ask questions. questions. Yep. Yeah. So, um, Jamie and I also do business coaching. We sure do. So, uh, we work with the restaurant tours particularly, but we work with any type of business. We've done gym owners, we've done all types of business owners, um, where we help you market. Uh, we have great programs, amazing programs. Uh, RestaurantGrowthSecretsUniversity.com. You can get all of our in-depth, cutting-edge marketing stuff, RestaurantGrowthSecrets.com. There's an online course there, 60, 70 hours of amazing video content. Uh, there's books to go with it. Uh, Jamie and I come with the program. We coach you. Uh, there's a whole whole. We do Facebook ads. We do whatever it takes for a restaurant to be successful. Basically, we will help them. We, we're strong. And that's our biggest thing. We want to help. We, we want to help. help them be successful, whether it's a restaurant or another business. Right. You know, independent businesses are very important. So the stuff that we apply to the restaurant industry applies to a lot of other things as well, other industries, businesses. So we love helping. Restaurant growth secrets. Uh, university.com or 50mistakes50mistakes.com are two great websites. You can get a lot of resources. So if you are a restaurateur, if you know a business owner, you know a restaurateur, send them there. There's mm -hmm. definitely a lot of resources they can definitely start using right away. Sign up for our email list there and um, educate. Educate yourself. Absolutely. What else? Uh, one last topic. So we could talk about uh, something to cook. We something could, to cook. Not even really cook, but to make for the, you know, for, for you to enjoy uh, my Rocky Road fudge. Oh yeah, <laughs> you just made this yeah. vegan Rocky Road fudge. It was really awesome. Um, very simple, very, very simple to make. Um, it is um, chocolate, so. You got, um, cho you got vegan chocolate vegan coins. Vegan chocolate coins. coins. Um, and A dark chocolate, no dairy. No dairy, yep, so it's vegan, so no dairy. 
Um, and so let's see, chocolate coins, um, organic sugar. Um, what else is in there? There's a little Vegan vanilla, marshmallows. there's marshmallows, pecans, um, and then the, the big pecans. ingredient is um, coconut cream. So Ooh. that was the big ingredient in there. So it's really coconut chocolate. Um, and the next one I'm gonna make, I'm gonna put a little peanut butter in there and kind of see, or, or Sun almond butter or sunflower butter. I might vote um, a sunflower butter. Yeah, I think I'm gonna try uh, try that in there. So, so swirl that in a little yeah. bit. So, you actually have to heat um, the coconut cream and the sugar together. Um, the double boiler? Uh, nope, not in just in in a pot and on low it, heat. On low heat. Or it. or double boiler if they wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. You're not putting the chocolate in yet. So oh, you're not. I'm sorry. The chocolate's not in. Coconut okay. cream. Coconut cream okay. and sugar. Okay, sorry. Uh, mix that in with a little vanilla, um, and then you take it. Um, off the heat and then you add a lot of chocolate so, oh, so a lot like of chocolate coins and then you add in your chopped pecans and your marshmallows and then whatever else you really want to put in there um, let it sit for a few minutes and then you put it in a pan lay it flat and put it in the fridge and you have fudge yeah so what would you say the ratio is of coconut cream to dark chocolate coins three to one four to one um, mm, that's a good question. Um, because it sounds like ganache is what this is. Um, typical classical ganache, you heat cream, you add a lot of chocolate to it, and you'll be surprised. You can add a lot of chocolate to scalding cream. Um, so, so scalding coconut milk, mm -hmm. you can probably add a lot of chocolate to it. I would venture to say it's so. It was like it was like 16 ounces, so two cups to. What are the coconut cream five? Those are eight, eight ounces? No, I think so. they're five point six ounces or something. Okay. Or five point eight ounces or something. So it's like that. a three to one ratio. So three to one. Three yeah. to one ratio. Yeah. Three to so one ratio. We're it's big. an awesome, awesome recipe. And uh, you know, you could just kind of fudge with it and move it around and, you know, kind of put add things in. You know, one of my favorite things to do is to take recipes and actually make them vegan. So that's kind of fun for me to, right. to do. I mean, and there's so many great recipes out there, you know, on online. I mean, just Google something, look for it, and yep. you know. I think there's one piece left. Is there? Yeah, there's one piece oh, left. <laughs> it's mine, you ate it all. Okay, there's two pieces left. Yeah, I knew you'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> we actually have friends who, you know, love it, loved it so much that they're like, can you make this, can you make this? And they're little kids. They loved it. They absolutely loved it. So, um, so I'm I'm excited to make it again and, and taste it. So, uh, you know, I love to bake. So that's my my thing is baking, baking, baking. So there's a lot of great um, things on Instagram now. A lot of great place things for people to follow. Oh yeah. V, there's v, a lot of vegan stuff. There's a lot of baked good stuff, and they put the recipe right in the description. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, really cool stuff and simple stuff. So, um, you get inspired from that very easily. Yes. Off of Instagram. So. Um, let's just mention our restaurant really quick because all this is happening. Our podcasts, our travel trips, our coaching business is all part, uh, we're all stemmed from our restaurant. So really the, uh, our restaurant is a sponsor of everything we do. Um, we love our restaurant. We have created a beautiful business over the last 17 years, since 2003, created a beautiful business. Um, so uh, where are we located, Jamie, and what do we do? We are located in uh, Ellenville, New York. Uh, the name of the restaurant is uh, Aroma Time Bistro. Um, we are 90 miles north of New York City. Um, so just a beautiful, beautiful area up here. And uh, like you said, we've been open since 2003. And so, um, you know, serving really good food. Um, very conscious about where everything's coming from, uh, including the bar, uh, including all of the wines and the spirits and the beers. Um, and it, it's really a fun time. and. Uh, we really enjoy it, and it's our it's our life passion, um, along with all the other fun things that we we do. It's really a relationship to table restaurant. Absolutely. We're farm to table, but really relationship to table. We love to know where our stuff comes from, who yep. makes it, all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, um, thank you everybody for, every much for everybody for tuning into our Chef on a Mission radio show, our Chef on a Mission show, Eat, Learn, Live. Uh, we're just restaurateurs that are broadcasting our passion um, just for real food yes. and to educate and help you make better choices and just give you all kinds of tips and everything. So thank you everybody for tuning in. We appreciate it. 
and um, look forward to many, many more episodes. This is a continuation of my original program, Chef on a Mission, that had well over 50 episodes. It went for over a year. And um, so this is just a continuation on that. Absolutely. And we are improving upon it. I'm super excited to be back. We sure are.